some of our alternatives um, for communication and the things Delco is expecting. Um, we'll understand how to have conversations uh, with families. Uh, and then uh, at the very end, we'll talk about early reporting um, and the use of Veritas. So, you know, professionalism and self-regulation, um, again, this is sort of a big team commitment. Um, and that goes between both the patient and the professional. So, you know, we have to have respect on both sides, both from the patient and from, from our side. But um, part of the things that make it really, uh, that make this uh, work a really effective communication, availability of teamwork. And we'll discuss all of those today as we go forward. So let's just consider a case. Um, it, it just happens to be a case that uh, we discussed this week as it actually happened this week in clinics. But um, family called the day after surgery, um, almost a week after surgery. Um, it spent an hour on hold. Um, called back the following day with another hour on hold. Uh, the call was returned two days later, um, all about a post-operative ear case with a facial paralysis. Um, so uh, the patient actually comes into clinic the following Monday without getting any medicines, uh, without getting any treatment. Uh, Chris, how do you feel about that care? Uh, I actually spoke to this patient on the phone two days after that clinic visit, and she hadn't been able to get her prescription filled, and so there was actually another whole two days of delay because wasn't able to get a prescription filled because of, well, I guess we can take that offline. We won't discuss that now. <laughs> how would you, how, actually, how would you feel if you were that patient? Significantly distanced. That might be a nice way of saying it. <laughs> um, they weren't really irate. They just wanted to figure out what, what could they do to get a hold of us. Um, but, but they were mad. Um, and not mad about the outcome, just mad about communication skills. And, and I think that starts. Um, you know, with, with everything that we try to do in triage and extends down through us. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> what do we do when these sort of things happen? How do we do service recovery? Um, and, and, you know, what do we do about these patient concerns, right? So they're sitting in your clinic um, fairly high rate um, about not being able to get a hold of someone. And um, how do we convey and how do we calm them down? And I think that's kind of a purpose of going through and understanding how patient relations work and how, how do we um, handle this. So, uh, Shanique, or Sharik, um, how, would you, uh, how, would you, how would you handle the family? What would you say to them? Uh, I apologize. Um, try to listen to their concerns and then try to take steps to remediate. Would you have your laptop open while you do it? Yeah. Okay, just, just check it. <laughs> I think that's really great. I mean, right? We want to connect with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We want to be warm. We want to be open. We want to be fair. Um, and I think that's part of our culture. Um, and, and people typically des describe this kind of herd phenomenon. So here, you know, be present, make eye contact. Um, you know, it's uh, it's one of these things that Mike Glasscock used to talk about all the time. Is that when he had a complication. Um, when he had a normal patient in the hospital, he would round once or twice. When a complication, uh, I'm not sure he would really round, but he would send the fellows by so often that they would have to ask the fellows not to keep coming by. Um, and, and I think that's part of it, just being present. Um, that empathize. Um, you know, even if it's not a um, true complication, um, there's obviously things that patients um, feel that, that we don't feel on our side. Um, acknowledge, respond, um, and then um, delegate documentation. How do we, how do we close this loop? Um, how many people in here have called patient relations? One. How many people? Yeah. I mean, it, it, they're there for you. And they're there 24/7, um, and there are um, supposed to be a. Um, sort of a, uh, an in-between between you and the family. They're not supposed to take either side, they're not supposed to protect you, they're not supposed to protect the family, but they're there to, to bounce things off. I find it very helpful to tell them when someone is extremely mad in the clinic uh, about it, because what I don't want is late reports and other things in our clinic. Do they have a way to risk management? They do. So they um, have communication back and forth. Um, it's a little different than Veritas, so when you fill out a Veritas, it goes through risk management first, Patient relations goes through patient relations, and then they will forward things on as appropriate. So if you call them and tell them that the, the patient was really irate, that they couldn't find parking in the parking lot, that probably doesn't go to risk management. 
but when you have a post-op facial paralysis or some other thing, they're going to forward that on to patient relations. And what's great about patient relations is that they take some of you out of the equation. So they put the bills on hold, right? So what makes an irate family even more irate is when they get home from their two-week hospital stay and they get a bill for $30,000, right, for their ICU stay and other things. So the ability to hold things um, is truly uh, phenomenal. And then um, just the way that they interact. This is something they do on a regular basis, right? They're there to, to calm people down, to appease people. It makes a big difference. Um, so, you know, one of the questions that always comes up is, why do patients sue? Um, so, Naman, why do you think patients sue? And if there's a complication and there's no, uh, you know, ownership about it, there's no communication about it, you know, the patient feels like they were abandoned or things like that. Good, Justin. <clears throat> yeah, uh, even if they're like, upset about certain things, they feel like things um, not communicated to earlier, the unexpected events. Yeah, and, and a lot of times, um, this is a, a nightmare for the color brand, um, but my times are advised. Sometimes they need, uh, they need money. Um, they believe there was a cover-up. There's a lot of different factors that go into it. But one of the biggest ones that we see is jousting, and we'll talk about that um, coming down the road. But, but being told to sue by another provider or someone else, it, it's something that we do subconsciously, right? We don't, we don't think that we're really jousting, but we often will. Um, and we know malpractice is disproportionate. Um, <coughs> Ashley is in the process of writing a nice paper in otolaryngology about malpractice cases. And we know that under 10% of our, our providers um, account for 90% of, of our um, lawsuits. Um, and as surgeons, we are at higher risk. Um, and what's high risk today is going to be high risk tomorrow. Um, and this is because we intervene. We have complications. We have things. And being able to communicate those things is important. So here you can see uh, a thing of the number or percentage of the patient or physicians and the number of complaints. Um, so as we look at kind of the top half, 10% of our physician population um, account uh, for half of the complaints and about a third to half of them get no complaints. So this is no different than any other things you see, whether it's complaints, it's lawsuits, it's other things. It's always this quarter, um, I was never good at math, but maybe a uh, exponential curve uh, where the, the end kind of occupies the majority. And this is important because as we've started to intervene on things, this is a number of lawsuits that we've seen um, at Vanderbilt um, per 100 physicians. This is the Tennessee average. So Tennessee has not changed at all. But what have we done to dramatically reduce our number of lawsuits? Well. This is all about PARs, so um, this is where uh, when you have a, a complaint against a physician that comes back and you get to, to know about it and understand it. This is where we instituted MM&Is, our allocation rebates, and we started to address these unprofessional behaviors. But our goal is to drive this to zero, and I don't think that that's realistic. But the more we intervene, the more we realize how to talk to patients. We're not going to, we have not from two, uh, 96, 97, um, although, Rob, when did you join the faculty? 2001. Is that that little spike right here? <laughs> um, no, but um, we, we haven't changed the number of complications. We've changed our ability to intervene with patients, right? We, we have done a better job of talking to our patients. But we know errors occur. Um, and poor communication is probably the number one reason that we see lawsuits um, come up. Um, and again, the small number of MDs attract a disproportional unit of shares. Um, we want to be able to address all of these complaints. So jousting. Um, you all have heard about jousting before, but um, it's, it's often, you know, when you say it, it's like being in third grade, someone says something, you kind of snicker a little bit because you think it's funny, but in the long run, it's not really funny. It really distracts from that patient-physician relationship. Um, you know, and it's, whether it's, um, you know, I, I can't believe that he did that, um, or, I mean, you know, anyone who's been on ontology, we get to hear some crazy stories about how someone was treated on the outside, right? You know, um, I can't remember who was in clinic for the Meniere's patient last week, where 15 years of low salt diet, diuretic, multiple procedures for someone who's got daily headaches and migraines, right? And you, it, it's not that you discount the outside provider, um, but I can't remember who came back in the room with me, but just say, ah, I'm sure you have Meniere's disease, but I think migraines are playing a bigger role, right? I'm not gonna discount what's going on the outside because 
that disrupts my relationship with the patient as well. Um, does that make sense from a jousting standpoint? Jousting, jousting in the hospital? All the time, right? And it's important to know that if you see something that seems as egregious as a joust, that that is a reason to put Veritas in because if you're hearing it, it's just like your friend who's telling secrets to you about someone else. If you're hearing it now, they're saying it about you when you leave also. And what's interesting when you look at the jousting um, data is that not only <coughs> is the jouster um, or the person you're jousting more likely to be sued, but the joustee or the person jousting is more likely to be sued. So in the long run, we're really just, we're, we're not only um, rape heightening our patients' awareness of things that might have gone on, but we're also disrupting that relationship. Um, so when we talk about adverse events um, and errors, I'm going to talk about a couple different scenarios. So obvious errors, um, when there's uncertainty about whether or not there's an error, and when there's no error. Right? Because these are three different things that we see all the time. Um, <clears throat> so just a case, you know, crushing uh, chest pain, calls uh, 911, goes into cardiac arrest, um, all efforts resuscitate, the patient comes into the ICU and dies. Um, still need to share with the family the outcome, right? Um, but I would say that there's no error in this case. This was something that was inevitable. This was something that we couldn't have changed. Um, but it's, again, it's about how do you communicate these things, right? So we want to be um, compassionate. We want to choose a quiet place um, where uh, we can comfort. Um, it's okay to have silence. It's, it's awfully awkward to be on that first date with silence. It's awkward when there's a, a bad outcome and you're sitting in front of someone and it's silent. But that's okay. It doesn't mean that there's anything that's wrong. It's just about being there in front of that person. <clears throat> Um, so what about if there's an obvious error? So 42-year-old <clears throat> um, has a hernia repair. A month later, uh, returns from a post-op visit, complaining of abdominal pain. Surgeon says normal incisional pain. Um, they call another month later, still having abdominal pain, go see your normal doctor. Um, primary care physician uh, sees them and x-rays them. Uh, obviously finds an untoward event. Uh, and... Uh, calls you up as a surgeon, uh, you obviously want that patient to come on in. The patient has some questions, right? Um, you, you know that this is coming, right? Um, and, and you know there's multiple people involved, right? So you have no idea what the primary care doctor said to them. Um, and then uh, you don't know what you're going to say to them until they're in there, right? There's going to be a lot of different outcomes and a lot of different ways that this patient can approach you. One is they may just be, you know, happy their hernia is fix, right? Go on in. And, uh, but most of those people are going to be a little bit irate, right? This is an unexpected outcome. I would call this a harm that we, and I think everyone would, would call this a harm. This is a trip back to the OR for something that I assume that the scissors weren't there before the surgery. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, how do you deal with this? How do we disclose from it? It, it is okay to apologize um, when an error occurs. It is fine to say you're sorry. There are um, for you, those of you who are fellows, there are certain states where apologies are considered confessions. So it's important to know what state you live in, uh, but in Tennessee, an apology is not a um, essentially a confession of doing wrong, right? You're just saying you're sorry. Um, and, and it's okay to, to say those things. Um, and what makes an apology effective? So, Ashley, what makes an apology effective? Thank you the measure that you're supposed to use is how the person that you're apologizing to perceives it. Um, and so I think making sure that they understand that you've listened and understood their actual complaint and problem, um, repeating it back to them, and then being genuine, I think is also important, making plans to follow up and right whatever wrong that happened. I, I mean, I agree with that 100%. How many of you have ever gotten that? <laughs> relationship apology, um, the, I'm sorry you feel that way, right? Like, like, to me, that's not an apology, right? That is just me saying, um, I really don't care what you think. Um, and uh, I think, you know, patients can pick that up, right? The, the sincere body language, sitting in front of them, uh, you know, uh, it, in these cases, I've always found when there's none toward that, it is um, perfectly okay to sit on the table and, and touch them, let them know that you actually care. Um, um, but again, 
you know, you have to feel out who the patient is and what the family's like. Um, but the patients are really much more willing to forgive. They have that relationship. And so it's important that, again, that we, we build on that. Um, so do, do apologies um, impact claim services? So, right, so every time a lawyer files a claim against the hospital, you know, check mark down, this is a claim. I mean, some go to some go to settlement, some go to, to trial, and sometimes you win and lose. Um, but apology laws were not found to limit medical malpractice, so, so they don't actually reduce these malpractice. When you look at this across the board, um, so in Kentucky, um, they increased settlements with reduction of the mean malpractice settlement. So they have more more cases with apologies, but the the overall dollar dollar was less. And again, um, same thing um, when up in Michigan. And, and overall, it's not about necessarily the number of claims, it's not about the dollars. I think it's the right thing to do. So, you know, I, um, it's not that you're making yourself feel better, but you want that patient to know that you actually care. And I think that's, you know, when they see that, that, that has the biggest impact overall. <coughs> um, you have some logistics. So who's going to manage what's going on, right? So, you know, um, you know, who's going to describe how this happened? Um, and it's important to be honest at this point. It is exceedingly um, painful to go out there after an acoustic neuroma and tell someone that the facial nerve was cut. Um, and it's um, it's heartbreaking. Uh, but it's something that we talked to them beforehand. It's something that we say, you know, this is that 1% chance. And, and we've sewed up together. We're going to see what goes on. And, uh, and we'll take it from here. But it's... it's it's very easy to, to go out there and say, well, this was a facial neuroma, and we did our best to save the nerve, and so we sewed it back together, right? I mean, you could come up with every excuse you ever wanted, but that's not the right thing to do, and that's not why we're here. Um, and then again, from the patient bill standpoint, um, again, call on patient relations, let's hold the bills, let's figure out what's going on before uh, we go down those next steps. What about when there's uncertainty? Um, uh, you know, 45-year-old referred for a large cholecystoma surgery at a lateral canal fistula and cephalosteel repair. Uh, hearing loss was mild after surgery uh, and no need for further surgery. So clean, safe ear. I call this a victory. Um, the patient did not. The patient had about a 10 decibel loss after after surgery. Um, it's still almost in the normal range. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's heartbreaking when you feel you're ready to walk in a room as a victory and they're seeing this as a defeat. Um, you know, and, and again, this is no different than, than the other side. It's, you know, we want to listen to what they want to say. Um, what is it that, that you're trying to convey? Um, and just say what the facts were. I mean, this is one of the ones where um, it's okay to sit there and, and listen to someone be angry. And it's okay to, to be there in absolute silence. And it's okay to use the line that we talked about yesterday, which is, you know, I, I totally respect your opinion. I just, I just disagree with it. You know, and it, it's hard to do in that setting because we're in this world where we always feel that there's a right and a wrong answer, right? That there's, we, we are built to be type A. Um, we feel that there's always a drive towards one answer. And sometimes what we think is the right answer and someone else thinks is totally different. And the ability to sit there and listen to someone say something that you don't believe in is part of being in that relationship. Um, and um, being able to tell them that you respect that opinion. Um, what about when there's no error that the patient or family um, perceives it? Um, so again, um, no different, just kind of be prepared, um, talk about it in an objective manner, uh, affirm that you've heard and understood what they're gonna say, and stick to the message. And again, we see this all the time also, right? And so. Um, this is no different than kind of that jousting side where if the family comes in and believes something that's different than what you believe, it's okay to just calm them down and just, and it's okay to walk away. And I don't mean you walk out of the room, but you say, you know, we're obviously on a different page. Let's, let's you know, take some time to think about it and I'll, I'll come back tomorrow or next week and we'll rediscuss things. Um, you know, here's, here's how I feel. Tell them what you actually feel uh, in, in concrete form. Um, so again, okay to agree to disagree. Um, and and uh, you know, it's okay to take that time out, um, you know, so, um, and, and to confirm that you're committed to their care. This is something, I'm not, I'm not asking you to leave and walk out and come back in a week because I'm tired of you. It's, 
I think we need some time. Uh, I think we need some time away. It's not you, it's me, right? You know, we've all heard that little expression, but it is um, it is true. I mean, sometimes families need a little time, especially if you're in a 12 year relationship, right? Ashley? Um, so, uh, how do we how do we report adverse events? Um, so, risk management is there. Um, so, at any time, you can get risk management. They are on call 24-7. Uh, you can enter a Veritas at any time. Um, I've always found it easier to call risk management because I get someone within minutes um, as opposed to waiting on, you know, going through the Veritas. But, you know, either way works. Uh, uh, and it can be anonymous uh, and no repercussions. And that's whether it is a outcome or whether it's an interaction, right? So. If you feel that there is a interaction that's inappropriate as well, it is perfectly okay to bear to us. Um, so again, going back to jousting, um, it's not really the, the dueling for turf. It's the cut. You know, we hear this all the time. If you're walking through any hospital, but this happens all the time. We haven't fixed that yet. Um, uh, you know, yesterday was a little bit frustrating in the MCEOR when they had uh, no equipment uh, for several hours for all of you that were there. I'm sure that you, um, if I had hair, I would have pulled it out. Uh, <laughs> but I tried to maintain my professionalism, which really meant walking away because I was so mad several times. Uh, but, it, but that's fine. Um, it's, it's what we don't want to do is, is joust, especially not in front of the families. Um, this is all important because this is part of our credo. We want to be, um, as, you want to be treated as a patient essentially the same way you would, you want your patient to be treated the same way you'd want to be treated if you were a patient. Uh, I think that's honesty, I think it's compassion, um, and there's a whole lot of services here to help support the risk management there. Um, there's a trust committee that looks through all these claims, um, and then again, just thinking about it from an overall patient relationship. Um, if you get jousted, it's, it's not professional, it's not who we are, it's not consistent with our credo. Um, it can happen anywhere. Um, it can happen in an elevator, it can happen in front of patients. Uh, but it does, it's no, it does break up the trust um, and the reputation, it does drive lawsuits. Um, and it's unprofessional, we, did, we just don't want to see it. So just in thoughts of why you think jousting occurs, hands, anyone? Well, people don't want to take away from themselves so they can check into another provider. Not Justin. Ego. Hmm? Ego. Ego. Jordan? Yeah, you want to justify it to your, yourself and your patients and other teams why, <coughs> why things are wrong. I think there's a lot of different reasons. Um, and a lot of people um, who are unsure of their technical skills, especially in the surgical field, are much more likely to jazz. They put up a big alarm about why it's not going to be their problem in the long run, right? This was, you know, your clastitoma would have been easy to take care of a year ago, but now, well, now it's really hard, right? So, I mean, you're already putting up these walls, and, and they, well, it seems, uh, you know, that you might be protecting yourself in the long run, those things actually hurt your patient relationship. Um, if you get jousted, there's a lot of different opportunities that you have. So, again, we talked about Veritas. Um, you can talk privately to the, to the person who jousted you. I, I don't, I, I've always been a firm believer in kind of that one-on-one -on -one conversation. I think that that's probably the most uh, humane of all the ways. Um, if you run into a lot of things, so someone may not be available, someone may be at an outside institution, I think it's perfectly fine to pick up the phone and call them and ask, you know, this is what I heard from the patient, is that what you're saying? And you're gonna hear one of two things. Yep, that's what I said. Or, no, it's not, because we've got to remember, not everything someone says, it's like that game of whatever monkey talks or whatever where it goes in a circle and the, the whatever someone said originally gets, you know, it, it essentially gets changed as you go around the circle. Um, and, and in my mind, it's not, you can't just say, you can't take someone, a patient's word right away and know that someone else said something. You have to kind of verify that. And think of a phone is tough. It's tough to pick up someone and say, Hey, I heard that um, you said my surgery was really lousy. Uh, you know, what, what, can we talk about this? Um, and sometimes they're going to say something that you don't want to hear. Oftentimes they're going to back away. Um, but it lets them know that you know what's going on. 
and that you're interested in this patient's care. It also tells them that they may not be doing the right thing, right? This is kind of like how you treat your teenage child um, when, they're, when they're acting um, poorly. Um, you know, again, um, always okay that to uh, have a cup of coffee with someone. If you can't um, find a solution to it, it is okay to escalate either through Dr. Evie or myself for, for this sort of jousting, that we're happy to pick up a phone and call someone or sit down with someone. Uh, and these professional conversations can always be had, and, and they're, they're always um, pretty easy. Um, so again, about promoting professionalism, we talked about these things uh, a little bit earlier, but effective communication, availability, teamwork, respect, self-awareness, technical competence, all of these things go into kind of our commitment to our to our families. We're gonna we really focused mostly on the effective communication today, and I think that's really what what we want to do. Is and it's it's hard. You all do simulations in med school to talk about how to do CPR, and some of that but no one ever tells you how to go in and tell someone that they've had a really bad uh, outcome, right? How do you how do you walk out there and say things didn't go how I wanted to, and it doesn't go well the first time you do it. It doesn't go well the second time you do it. it, it for, you know, um, it's always awkward. Um, but having that conversation is that first step towards getting recovery. Um, and we want to align with our values, right? We want quality in healthcare. We want it to be safe. We want to be professionals. We want this to be a place of respect and dignity for our families, for our patients, and even for each other. And that goes down through all these things we talked about today. Um, Behaviors that, that interfere or be undermine a culture. So again, we talked about jousting. Um, we talked about things that violate policies. But everything's about safety. We, we want to be on board with creating a safe practice. Some common failures um, for things that undermine safety. So um, hand hygiene. We talk about all the time. People that wash their hands are more likely to do other things right. Um, answering pages to things from jousting. Um, all of these things undermine our culture of safety. And I'll just leave it up here for a second where you can look at it, but even protocol adherence to timeouts, right? So we always want to get the next thing done. But it's all about just taking a deep breath and understanding that all of these things go into to undermining culture. So what do we do when professionalism is, is disturbed? Um, and so it kind of starts at the... This, the uh, you know, where we see a single unprofessional incident, you know, um, we get these veritases, we look through them, um, if you're a resident, you <coughs> gets them as well. Um, and most of them, it's, uh, okay, um, you know, Ashley had a tough day today, we're not going to do anything more with this, right? So, when there's an apparent pattern of interactions or apparent pattern, that's where we start to intervene, especially if a pattern persists. Um, and there is good evidence that shows that interventions help us a ton at, at our institution. So about three quarters of the people that have an intervention don't have other interventions. And that's whether you talk about um, Veritas events or even um, in our uh, PARS data, where most of the people, when they're given their own data, can correct what they're doing wrong and make, make adjustments. The ones at the bottom are the egregious or mandated um, ones. Um, those go straight to chairs. Um, those automatically mandate a cup of coffee. Those are the physical violence, sexual abuse, anything along those lines. So again, um, we're dealing mostly with this left side, and hopefully all these things down at the bottom. Um, does it work? Well, yeah. I mean, our hand hygiene has gone from 50 to 95%. Um, We've addressed uh, behaviors that undermine culture of safety, which have reduced uh, lawsuits. Uh, we work a lot on our physician uh, practice uh, in terms of prescribing. We've seen our malpractice things go down. Um, and uh, we see it here, it's the bundles. It's, it's uh, all these things go into the safe culture. So again, informal conversation. Um, some of you I've had a conversation with in the past, hopefully. Um, won't have second conversations in the future. Uh, it's hard for me to do because I know how everyone cares about their job, but it's sometimes it's, it's just a level of self-awareness. Okay, here's something that I that I saw, and I just it's not in a punitive way. This is a um, I want to make sure that you're okay. Um, you know, saw this report. It doesn't sound like something I 
expect Russell Reese to do. Let, let's sit down and have a cup of coffee, right? Let's let's talk about what happened. Because there's always two sides to every story also. Um, when we do this, it's non-judgmental. It's respectful, non-defensive. This is meant to just understand both sides of the story, right? We don't want to uh, incorrectly uh, impugn <coughs> someone for something they may or may not have done. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, we're just talking through these aspects. What happened? Um, who was there? Um, where Where are we? Um, and all of these things for an, for an informal conversation are just the same as when we talk to family with an adverse event. Um, we want to make sure that we pay attention. We want to make sure that someone knows that we care. Uh, and, and again, it's about respectful non-judgment. Right? We don't want to go into this conversation already with a preconceived idea of what the outcome is going to be. Um, last thing is just timely reporting. So as part of our malpractice uh, self-trust, uh, uh, we uh, adhere to the fact that we will uh, report any adverse events uh, within five days of knowing of them. Uh, and that occurs in kind of two different avenues. One is when you know right away that there's an adverse event. The other is when you find out about an adverse event months later. So I'll give you two examples. You go to the OR, you cut the accessory nerve, right? That's a, <coughs> whatever happens in the OR, that's, that is a, I'm going to report it now. We knew it happened. Uh, this is an a, uh, unexpected outcome. And then there's the uh, patient comes back with a post-op follow-up, um, and you realize that their pre-op chest x-ray showed a lung mass, and, and that wasn't addressed, right? You know, that might be two months after the actual x-ray, but this is the first time you've seen it. And that doesn't mean that you're going to be impugned for um, not having reported already. That clock starts when you find out that there's, that there's something wrong. So again, and even if it is um, something that you forget about for two weeks or three weeks, we still want you to report it, right? We want it out there. The earlier someone intervenes on your behalf, the better things are going to be. Um, and again, no different than um, uh, professional concerns. You can call risk management, you can call Veritas. Um, again, it can be anonymous, no repercussions. Um, even if you leave your name, um, there's supposed to be no repercussions to this at all. I'll just kind of open up for comments and questions. Rob? So, um, the Veritas thing seems to work very well for uh, behavioral problems, but it doesn't seem to work so well for institutional problems. And I've heard Paul Russell say it multiple times that he's very tossed in every case in the OR because he doesn't have the right equipment. So you, you show those metrics, which are fantastic, and I think those are more egregious. But could you give us an update about what we should be doing for those type of things? Like, should I bear toss what happened yesterday? Uh, it, yeah, the answer is we should have bear toss. We bear toss for every case, which is painful. It's seven, eight minutes um, uh, to, to, to enter a full bear toss. We actually timed it. Um, uh, there's the professional acts you don't hear any um, side to. So you file Veritas and said, you know, Mark Bennett did this, this, and this. You don't hear anything about it. I hear about it through whoever's contributing, right? The, the non professional, the I didn't have my equipment, other things. Supposed to have a manager give you feedback and all of these. I actually learned this yesterday. So, um, in my anger after the day, um, uh, talking with Dr. Hickson is that there's supposed to be feedback from those managers on all of those cases back to you. Um, I don't know that I've ever had one um, in the first class I filled out. I think um, I've, I have um, been a proponent that there ought to be two different aspects of Veritas that there ought to be. Veritas, that's the professional and action, and there ought to be some sort of, uh, you know, my, my tray wasn't clean, um, some some different mechanism, but at this point, it doesn't appear that there will be one. Um, but but I do think when those events happen, <coughs> that, um, it is worthwhile to fill out a Veritas. Otherwise, there's no long-term accountability for it. Even though in 18 years, it's not made any difference at all. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I think um, when you don't get a response, so next week I will address it with Noah and, and ask what the plan is the next time that happens. Um, 
So are there plans to change that for the process moving forward? Because I have not heard this plan. I mean, um, the you know the CPPA um, and QSRP are always interested in feedback. So um, if you want to send an email to Jerry Hickson about that, I think that that's a very reasonable um, thing to ask. <coughs> and he's he's very thoughtful about it. So yeah. he's obviously created the system, so he wants it to work as well as possible. Other questions? I have a, I think I have a sign in sheet. So if you were here and asked to be here, it's really important. I don't know that we have, we have numbers, Sheree. Oh, I thought it was, I didn't handle that part, but I can okay. look, I can look. Okay, um, does everyone send Sheree an email today telling them that you were here today? I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> He's full of jokes this morning. 